Now, Stephanie Alexander, I'll just say a few words about this woman that I'm sure you all have heard about and know well. She's one of Australia's most highly acclaimed food critics and food authors with 14 books to her name. 14 books to her name. That's pretty <laughs> impressive, isn't it? Her signature publication, The Cook's Companion, has established itself as a kitchen bible in over 400,000 homes. With characteristic determination, Stephanie initiated the kitchen garden at Collingwood College to allow, allow young children to experience the very things that made her own childhood so rich. The growing, harvesting, cooking and sharing of good food. In her recently published memoir, A Cook's Life, she recounts how her uncompromising dedication to good food has shaped her life and changed the eating habits of a nation. She's also an alumna of the Faculty of Arts at the University of Melbourne. And if you've seen the book, there's a photo of her on graduation day in 1966. So we're very, very happy to have her back here at, in the Faculty of Arts. And she was just saying she remembers English lectures here with singing lecturers in, back in the day. I don't sing in my lectures anymore, but maybe I should take it up. And Annie Smithers. Annie Smithers beca began her culinary career by serving an apprenticeship with Stephanie. After working in many of Melbourne and regional Victoria's top restaurants, Annie opened her own restaurant, Annie Smithers Bisto, in the historic town of Kyneton, and that's where I first met her. Uh, she opened that restaurant in 2005. The bulk of the produce from Annie's French bistro-style food is sourced from her own garden. And the menu is shaped daily according to which ingredients are in season. Uh, Annie recently opened a cafe and food store called Du Fermier in the nearby township of Trentham. Annie's garden table, oh sorry, Annie's garden to table is her first book. It's a long way behind the book. <laughs> <laughs> and you can also catch Annie on the morning show The Circle. She's been a regular guest on The Circle for about eight months and it's looking like turning into a monthly gig. And of course, you've probably seen her column, her monthly column in the Epicure in the Age. So welcome to both of you here <coughs> for this evening. And um, I'd like to open the floor to questions and conversation a little bit later on. But before we start that conversation, um, I'd wonder if you might just both speak a little bit about your new books, Stephanie. Right, well, writing a memoir, very, very different to writing a recipe book. And um, I must say, when it was handed to me, I thought, well, that's a slight little thing after, uh, after I've had these things that, you know, could fall and crush your foot. Um, but I do think, looking back on the history, my, the history of food as I have lived through it has been really very interesting. And Melbourne's food scene has changed, of course, beyond recognition. Um, since the first time I cooked professionally in 1966, um, it's, just, it's just extraordinary the things that have happened. And I did think there was some value in describing the sort of availability of produce then and as opposed to as it is now. Because I, my, one of my concerns is that young people in the industry today who are doing marvellous things and are very creative and very capable but they don't seem to realise often just how long it has taken to get some things into the mainstream and how many marvellous people, most of them migrants, who have brought to this country some wonderful skills and traditions which we are all the richer for. So the book is, yes, the story of my life, there's some, some slightly racy bits. I wouldn't say it was particularly... <laughs> I wouldn't say it was particularly racy. There's, um, as I said, there's some sad bits, but there's also a lot about food. And I also think, looking back on the history of Stephanie's Restaurant, which ran for 21 years, we were very brave. We were very innovative. We did a lot of things for the first time. And I'm now old enough that I can say that often the things that are lauded as being new and wonderful were on our menus back in the 80s. Well, 66 keeps being mentioned. You, you graduated, you started cooking and I was born, so... <laughs> <laughs> we, 
Steph Stephanie and I were, sort of worked to, or I worked for her or with her all those years ago in 1984 and it was the grounding of what has become my life as a cook. Uh, it was a, a grounding in a very beautiful family style kitchen to work in where everyone was treated carefully and uh, to their merits. It was an introduction to food that was, you know, while my mother cooked extremely well, um, that was quite beyond anything that I'd ever known. And in the early 80s, food was, as Stephanie has said, very different to what it is now. Uh, I can remember having air freighted smoked salmon and, you know, lobbed onto my list of sort of slice this like they do in Harrods. And of course, I'd never been to Harrods in 1984. <laughs> but uh, all of this has led to sort of my life as a cook, as sort of 30 odd years of cooking. And some years ago on our annual crab apple dinner, I think Stephanie said to me, when are you going to write a book, Anne? I said, oh, I don't know. I said, between you and Hugh Fernley Whittingstall, there's not a great deal that uh, yeah, I've got to say. Uh, but over, over those years, I, I became very aware of the fact that uh, the, the food media has changed food as we know it uh, in Australia and around the world, but particularly Australia are very fond of food media. And no one really takes into account the fact that... Uh, you know, there's a, there's a famous magazine shoot of a souffle on a popular food magazine that took 200 souffles to get the perfect shot. No one knows that. No one cares about that. And you're certainly not as home cooks going to spend, you know, make 200 souffles to get the perfect one, aren't you? So the idea of the book was to actually write a book that was about successes and failures. You know, we live in a world where failures, you know, no one fails anything at school anymore because they're, you know, they're to be encouraged. Well, I find that failing things both in the kitchen and in the garden and in life in general, really, are the things that you actually learn the greatest lessons from. You don't learn an enormous amount from your huge successes. It doesn't open your mind up to say, why hasn't this worked? Why won't it work? Whereas when something doesn't grow in the garden or something doesn't cook in, you know, work in the kitchen, you have to start to analyse and say, you know, what have I done wrong? Where, where could I improve it? So my little book is really the ups and downs of growing food, reconnecting with food, starting it from a seed, nurturing it through to something that can be used, whether it's perfect or not, it has to be used because I've spent so much time looking after it, <laughs> and about decent home cooking about being able to go out into a, either into a farmer's market or into your own backyard and actually cooking something simple and beautiful and nutritious for dinner and enjoying it and not looking for it to be a magazine cover but just looking for it to be something that is loved and shared and cared for. So that's what my little book's about really, I think. <laughs> Every cookbook is a narrative. It always tells a story of some sort. Even those colonial cookbooks that told us how to cook a bilby in the old British settlement days in Australia. And of course, plopping a bilby in a pot of milk with some white peppercorns and a few bay leaves tells us that the women of those times were hoping that bilbies would poach up nicely like a couple of fat rabbits. And I wonder whether the love of books and reading that you've obviously demonstrated and that have been part of your family histories actually have helped you find that voice in which to talk about food in your books. Absolutely. I mean, I started out as a librarian. I started out uh, as a university student with a keen interest in doing a general arts degree. Um, and I failed fine arts. That's why the discrepancy in the years. I had to go away and then come back and finish. Yeah, it's all right. It's all right. <laughs> um, and I've told in the in the the book the story of the fine arts, the lectures in the dark. The lecturer was an appalling accent who wrote nothing on the board, so it complicated the issue when you were trying to find these wonderful works to look up in the library. Anyway. Um, certainly books have always been a very big part of my life. For 10 years I was a very happy librarian. It didn't occur to anyone, my, including myself, that there was a, pro a career in f food professionally, although I always knew that food was what I did for fun and for love and um, that it <coughs> could absorb me very uh, completely. But I have always warmed to fabulous food writing. 
My hero is Elizabeth David, and I was reading Elizabeth David from the 60s on, and I find that there's very little that has beaten her in, in my experience of her ability to be able to actually pin the essence of a dish, not to mention use the English language so beautifully. So books are very important. Um, but I, I come from a... I, I, I have a mother who spent a lot of time here and uh, taught literature for 46 years or something. So I have had uh, a very beautiful upbringing with many, many books. And I think the, the art of... The art of being able to read, the art of being articulate, and the art of language has been incredibly important to me in understanding food and being able to actually express it both as a as a cook and as a person. And it's um, you know it's a it's a very lovely gift being able to have all of those things. I think so. Books are very important to me too. So I'm wondering about your influences from abroad and. Being head of French studies here at the University of Melbourne, of course I'm interested in how much France and the experience of the French way of life involving food, French cooking styles, French techniques might have actually influenced your own development as um, cooks. I'm probably the only person in the world who's ever failed French 1A twice. <laughs> <coughs> However, it was so badly taught is what I say, because... <laughs> I wasn't here. <laughs> because I loved French mm. and I, I, took, I was a very good student when in other environments. Um, in the book, there's a pretty um, bad patch in my life on a French cargo boat yeah, where I actually... bit. Yeah, where <laughs> I, where I learned racy. quite a lot of French. <laughs> and, then I, and then I went to be an au pair in a French family and that was wonderful. And, <laughs> and I have over the years spent a lot of time in France and there's no question that my food is very strongly influenced by all that I've learned in France. I mean, I love Italy and Italy is there all the time in the food that I cook too. But I guess, yeah, I think I probably would still say that my instinct is to arrange food in a French manner. I, I do love that succession of small courses, and I do love the idea of allowing an ingredient to speak for itself, and to, if it's going to have an accompaniment, that's probably a separate course. So France is very, very big in the way I work with food. Mm, I love the chapter title that you have, Radishes and Butter. It's one of the simplest mm. entrees that you could find anywhere in the world, surely, as long as you have a good salt to go with the butter as well. 1976, we served radishes with butter in Ligon Street, in Brunswick Street, and nobody had ever heard of anything. They thought it was so innovative. <laughs> and, and I mean, I, I knew that it was just the classic little simple introduction to a family-style meal. Mm. I haven't spent a lot of time in France. I haven't really spent a lot of time anywhere other than Melbourne and Victoria. But uh, I think that my general food interest is very, very well rooted in the French uh, French cuisine and it mainly came from the fact that as a child and well into my adolescence I actually didn't like food very much and I didn't I wasn't a very excited eater I liked things like steak and bernets chips chocolate mousse all those incredibly you know sensible French dishes that were around in Australia in the uh, mid early to mid 70s uh, but that that grew and grew and one of the things that I find most extraordinary about the French, you know, the French cuisine is that as a cook, it allows you to have the very simplest of food, but it also allows you to really execute some extraordinary skills and some you know, real tests of your technique with lots of boning and uh, sharpening and stuffing and that sort of thing. But the thing that has become most important for me, you know, coming now from a regional area is the replication of, you know, a good, a good French household or a good, you know, much more European style household. When, um, when the book was being, with the Penguin, we have a recipe tester. And uh, the recipe, they, they trust you at Penguin. They don't test very many of your recipes. But um, 
the recipe tester tested the rabbit riette recipe and she was absolutely appalled and sent a note back to my editor and said, can't you get Annie to do a pork one or a duck one because rabbits are so expensive. It cost me $96 to buy the ingredients in Sydney for a block of rabbit riette. Sydney for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I sent back a little note saying, well, no, you're missing the point because in a traditional household, one of the things that is, you know, in, in my little style of life, that is the easiest thing to keep and the easiest thing to keep reproducing when it's hot, when it's cold, is a hutch of rabbits. And that's, it's the simplicity of that farm life that is quite small. You know, I live on an acre of land and it feeds, it provides vegetables for 240 people a week, which is quite you know, a feat, I think. But it's bringing it back to that acre of land and saying that, you know, We've got really confused, and I think that the Europeans, particularly the French, understand that a great deal more than you know, the average Aussie. Yeah. Um, what about your local influences? I've just asked you about your international influences. You've both been trailblazers, but in terms of sustainable gardening and restaurant movement, were there, anybody, were there any other people who were trying to do the same things at the same time that you were? And do you think there's more of it now? Oh, it's much more now. It's become mm. quite fashionable now. And, and it, whilst I might make funny jokes about it being fashionable, um, it can only be a good thing. I mean, the fact that people want to grow their own, some of their own food, want to frequent farmers' markets, want to go to roadside stalls, that's all fabulous. But once upon a time, that was how life was, was lived a lot more often. And certainly when I grew up, um, my mother grew food, not because it was fashionable, but because she had to grow food. I mean, she didn't, it was a very limited family income and there was a bit of land and it would have been, I think in her opinion, would have been appalling to have done, not used this land. And, um, and that is the sort of sensibility that I think I grew up in. And also she was interested in, even then, in trying to grow things that were not mainstream. You know, and I remember her, the first time she fed us Warrigal greens, which was or New Zealand spinach, whatever you want to call it, and she'd pureed it all, and she told us this was something um, incredibly special, and we all looked at it with a suspicion because it looked like pond slime, <laughs> and uh, was I was un unfamiliar with a puree of spinach at the time, but she had she knew it was an edible crop, and so she wanted to try it, and so there were all sorts of interesting little things that came in, and so I knew that. You looked around you and you used what you could um, and there was always something interesting about it. Uh, I think that after the Second World, <coughs> World War, so many people did have small back mm. gardens and, small f and front gardens. I grow most of my vegetables. Unfortunately, I don't have an acre because I live in a, su in a suburb <coughs> and I grow most of my vegetables in the front garden, which is a bit astonishing to the neighbours going past. <laughs> but it actually causes a lot of conversation. Mm. If I'm out there, um, tying up the tomatoes, which I'm not anymore because they're finished, somebody will stop mm. and will say to me, that's an entry, what variety is that? And so we actually have a conversation mm. about it. It's a lovely way of engaging with people. You know, my, my main influence, I suppose, is her. <laughs> <laughs> she, she's the star. Yeah. Um, but it's that, love of, it's that love of food. But also, you know, going back, you know, in a sense, to that French context is... In central Victoria, I'm very lucky to live in a region that sort of, you know, has potatoes here and apples there and a good wine region here and extremely good sort of, you know, cattle and sheep producing area. So I live in really a very, very beautiful part of the world and it's just, it, it would be criminal not to take, you know, advantage of all those things that are around us. And we make decisions based on what people actually farm in our location. So, you know, we don't grow a lot of potatoes. We don't give over space because we have so many potato farms. But we do grow a lot of apples because we're, you know, concerned about the, the monocultural farming and things and we're, you know, we're very specific about our heritage plants and our heirloom vegetables and that sort of thing. So the local area, you know, for me is completely intrinsic in what I actually do at the restaurant and, and Obviously, because I'm growing stuff, I need to work out what actually grows in my dirt and what grows in my climate. So the best way to find that out is to talk to everybody else around me. I think there should be a mention made of the farmers' market, the movement for farmers' markets, because it's incredibly important. 
and certainly in Melbourne itself, there's, there's very few people who, do, who live too far away. I mean, you can every, almost everybody can get to a farmer's market on a Saturday if they w want to. And if you have not a regular farmer's marketer, I urge you to give it a go because not only do you buy fabulous food, but you get to have the most fantastic conversations. And the, you know, the potato man or the mushroom person or the, the, the beef man will talk to you about what they're actually got to sell and you come away feeling just uplifted. Or if you're a food lover, you come away feeling fantastic and you really value what you've got in your basket. Um, and I couldn't imagine, a w if I'm in Melbourne, I can't imagine a weekend without a farmer's mm. market. <laughs> my, my little acre of land where I live is in, uh, in Malmesbury. So it's, uh, it's about an hour up the highway, up the Calder Highway. Um, I don't frequent farmer's markets with my produce because I only really have enough for the restaurant. Mm. But the, the Macedon region has an, an enormous number of farmer's markets. There's the Lancefield farmer's market, the Kyneton farmer's market, there's Woodend, Trentham, Dalesford. So it's, a, it's an area that sort of is quite rich in those uh, things, but I'm just an hour up the road, <laughs> chugging around on my little red tractor. <laughs> Driving fast is all I can say. Well, I think there is an art in writing a good recipe, and I think, the big, for me, it's absolutely critical that you don't leave anything to the imagination. If, or to, because my whole philosophy about, that underpins the cook's companion is remove anxiety. And the only way to remove anxiety is to make sure that people don't feel that you're making assumptions about what they know about an eggplant. You know, do I peel it? Does it have to be round? Does it have to be purple? Can I bake it? Can I steam it? Can I boil it? Um, I want to make sure that anyone reading a recipe that I write isn't left with a question in their head. They can just start and it will work. So it's, they tend to be a bit longer some people, I mean, some of my recipes are quite short, but some of them do tend to go on a bit, and I do try very hard to get rid of extraneous words, but I also want to make sure that there is no room for anxiety. What can I say? They have influence on another gener on a different generation of chefs to the ones that I know, but I would like to say from my own perspective, am I ever, never going to buy a pineapple? Am I never going to buy a coconut? Of course I am even though I know they don't grow in my backyard and they never will grow in my backyard. But I believe in sustainable methods think, and... Yeah, yeah I, think, I think that um, one of the things that, you know, is a huge generational shift is this notion of sustainability. And sustainability is not just about sort of, you know, how food is produced, it's how we live. You know, whether we work unsustainable hours, the sort of clothing that we choose, whether our cotton is farmed sustainably. You know, the sustainable question should not be limited just to food. It actually encompasses the whole world of work and production of goods. Um, quality is incredibly important to a top class restaurant. Mm. Uh, it is one of the defining things where, which is I suppose, well, I'll, I'll never be a top-class restaurant because I'm happy to serve beans that are wonky and asparagus that's crooked. But um, <laughs> it's, there is a need for perfection. And a lot of that is actually also about the pressure that is placed on us by the dining public. So if you go to one of Thomas Keller's restaurants and diners will often be much more judgmental about what they get... So he has to throw those balls in the air and try and find what is the happy medium. But for me, sustainable practices of you know, animal husbandry, sustainable practices of farming, sustainable practices of dealing with your rubbish and your laundry and things, it's a, it's a huge ballpark. Will it, damage, will it damage the efforts of the sustainability movement? I don't think terribly. Yeah, I think that everybody realises that these men are at the very, very top of their game and they live in quite exalted circles that, uh, you know, just because they say, you know, quality over geography, it's not going to change the groundswell of the movement of sustainability. quality first, they're still going to prefer 
locally available product if it's if it's of a sufficient quality. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. They're not going to say, well, we, we're desperately going to get our and asparagus from Peru because we think it's... They won't have asparagus on the menu because yeah. it's not in season. Yeah. I think the other thing is, is that a lot of the, the restaurants go for food that is not part of the normal buying practices of the big chains. And that immediate, and this is one of the things that I've found in growing a lot of food, is that it doesn't matter if one year it cost me $50 a kilo for everything I grew in the yard, because I was growing things I couldn't buy, so therefore it's priceless. So it's a bit of a, I can understand your concern, but I think it'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> the, I mean, the, the, my life has come full circle. I've been spending a lot of time working with young people all through my career. But now I am convinced that in order to bring have a generation of Australians who do have a realistic idea of how their food is prepared, what it takes to prepare a beautiful salad or what it takes to grow something lovely, that you need to start when they're very, very young. And hence my program in uh, government primary schools, where we have this every week for children aged between 8 and 11. Every week they have a session in the garden that they have helped build in their school grounds. Every week they have a session in a kitchen, they've convert a space they've converted into being a very simple teaching kitchen. And every week they sit around a table and with the food that they have grown and cooked and it is absolutely delicious and those children's lives are changed. And what's more, I can say quite strongly, there is a very significant trickle down effect into what is happening back at home. Because they do go home and they're incredibly proud of what they've done. They talk about it to their mother, their father or their grandparents. They influence the family shopping basket. They want to grow little gardens at home if they've got any space at all. And those children have a totally different idea about flavour, texture, and they love it because we give it to them. The philosophy of the program is it's got to be fun. No wagging of fingers. No saying no salt, no fat. Don't do any of that. Just get them into it so they really understand how beautiful fresh food is and how it still needs sunshine, it still needs rain, you still need to feed the soil and you must be careful because your food is precious and you must look after the, look after the, the planet. And it really works very, very well and I'm, you know, we're very proud. We're influencing well over 30,000 Australian children every week currently and we're about to expand with new money from the federal government <laughs> that need a big tick. <laughs> Um, fa failures that, yeah, the, the sort of failures that I'm talking about is that, um, you know, one of the things that I find, you know, and Stephanie talked before about writing recipes and saying that sort of, you know, she wants to remove all anxiety from it, is that, you know, most of us have tried a recipe and it's failed, you know, and a lot of us at home will just say, oh, look, that's just too hard, I'm not doing it again. Quite often in a commercial kitchen, you actually do it again. It's like practising your scales, you know. You know, you have to keep doing it, you have to keep practising it. And it's actually by that sense of failing things that you start to nut out where it's going wrong and how you can improve it. The other thing for me that sort of is the one that I'm most frightened of, and it does happen every so often, is that we, we don't quite fail service, but service being that time where all your orders come in and we cook it and send it out in a timely manner. But sometimes service just goes completely wrong for no other reason, and it is the most hideous experience <laughs> and in fact we had one on Friday night that was very hard and I think that's for me that's the failure that you know I need to you know make sure is really corrected so that we don't actually go through that anxiety over and over again so it's the it's things like that. Uh, what, <laughs> what happens is that what we always say in the industry is the bus arrives so everybody arrives at five past eight and they all have their orders in quarter past eight. <laughs> But I, I would answer that for myself by saying <clears throat> one of our school gardens, in a, one of our schools, had their orchard looking beautiful after about two years and some nasty little person in the weekend rode, it, rode a trail bike over every tree. And that, of course, was devastating for the children. But look, they learnt from this. It was, a, it was a horrible lesson, but it was to do with pick yourself up, 
They pulled all the debris out of the this ground. They mulched it all and put it in the compost. They put a note. They put a little story in the local newspaper. <laughs> and by the next week, they had been, had about, I think 20 new trees donated. But the children learnt that you can start again. Yeah. And <clears throat> and I think in a, an age that we live in where everything's so instant, it was really a very important lesson. You know, we've, we've watched over these trees, they're looking so healthy, they're suddenly completely devastated, we can do it Start again. Start again. And I think that's a really important one. <laughs> well, the obvious answer is you probably wouldn't feel much like eating. <laughs> if you know. But I'd probably be going for a cheese sandwich. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not, I'm not ready for that yet. No. <laughs> it changes every day. They are wonderful stories. They sort of can make my sort of skin go, you know, whatever it does, you know, that sort of feeling. Um, some of these kids really develop, they're just marvellous. They just tell us just what it means to them. We had a little boy in a school in the Mallee who we call Farmer Jack because we did put his story on our website. And he was incredibly impressed with what he was doing at school. And he, he did live in a rural um, town, I mean, rural place. His father was a farmer. And so he went home and he said, which doesn't incidentally mean that he has a wonderful idea about food, which is, was a bit of an eye opener to me, that a lot of these kids in, from country towns really have just as limited a diet as some of the children in the urban areas. Anyway. He went home and he wanted to grow his own garden and he had very grandiose ideas about what he wanted to grow. And his mum said, well, I think you better, Dad better get the tractor out. <laughs> and, uh, and they made him a really significant patch of uh, ground. And he wrote, and he, so he planted all his seeds, he did everything correctly. And he then wrote to us and he said, you know, what I'm doing is I'm harvesting my crops, I weigh them, and I enter it in, a, I've made a log on the computer, and I, and, I, and I weigh exactly how many beans I got out of this, that and the other. And he says, it's absolutely marvellous. I've rigged up a thing to the kitchen window, a bit of string. <laughs> and when I'm at school, I say to mum, when she, every time she walks past the kitchen window, she should pull this string be, to, get the, to get the birds away from Aww. my crop. <laughs> and then his mother wrote and said it was a very hot night and she was feeling overwhelmed with the heat. She said, and she did one of those motherly sighs, I don't know what we're going to have for tea tonight. And Jack says, don't worry, Mum, I'll whip something up. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's lovely. I don't know what he whipped up. But then we have lots of stories from lots, lots, lots of stories. We have principals who say their absentee rates drop dramatically on the days that the, they have kitchen and garden in a school. We have children queuing to get into the classroom and get into the garden, you know, half an hour before the bell goes because they're so enthusiastic about these classes. So it actually makes, and we also would like, would like to say we also have a curriculum writer so that we integrate the learning that they have. They're not just digging in the garden, they're not just chopping in the kitchen, they're not just enjoying the fresh pasta they've made with the silver beet and ricotta f stuffing. Yes, they're doing all of that. But they're also learning, they're measuring, they're estimating. They're, they're wondering how much water they need in their frog pond and they've measured the, the diameter and blah, 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 things that I don't even Maths, know how you English. do it. They also, they're using new language. We try to put light, um, in the garden that the beans will have three different languages on the the wooden spoon that's the um, labels, what I'm trying to say. What am I saying? The, mark, the label that's marker it, on the it. plant. And <laughs> they're learning about art and design. They learn what I think is incredibly valuable. They learn about cultural difference. We point out to them that rice, you know, rice is, can be cooked in this way. It can be a risotto, it can be a pilaf, it can be God knows what else, sushi. And they understand that different people use ingredients in different ways and it breeds tolerance, understanding. We tell them stories. I mean, it's just amazingly wonderful program. And I think the thing is, is that you know, with the success of the Kitchen Garden Foundation is that most primary schools would like to have one. So it has a, I had, I had 40, 40 little red jumpers come up my garden path yesterday. <laughs> yes, which is quite alarming. But um, <laughs> they, um, 
you know, Mar Marmsbury Primary School doesn't have a, a, a Stephen Alexander Kitchen Garden Foundation garden, but they do have a garden and they are, you know, it's a movement that is sweeping the primary schools quite dramatically. And the interest and the love from these kids about what food is and where it comes from, they're particularly interested in warm compost, though, all those little boys. <laughs> Well, you should tell the people from Malmesbury Primary School and anyone here who's involved with the primary school, even remotely, that to keep an eye on our website, kitchengardenfoundation.org.au, because within the next two months, we will be announcing ways in which this program can be, three key words, accessible, flexible, what's the other one? Affordable. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, it's had a lot of cost like issues. restaurant dining. <laughs> Uh, look, I, I keep very, I have a very busy life um, and in fact uh, I've recently, Simon who has been my gardener has uh, decided to hang up his trowel uh, and we've made a momentous decision. I have a, a very small restaurant, it seats about 35 people and it's a very close-knit family staff, um, family as in we're not related but you know, we're, we're very close, we, you know, there's I can't even remember how many of us there are. I think there's about nine of us, you know. But uh, a couple of the key members of the uh, front of house staff actually want to come and work in the garden. So we'll be, I'll be spending a day out there with both of them one day a week. So that actually encompasses what, what Simon's hours were. And I'll just keep pottering away at my general task. So we keep the restaurant at a certain level. So it's a bit of a balance to make sure that we can grow enough food for the number of people that we're feeding. So that it's, it's a tight little balance. And there are days where we had a big weekend last weekend and Monday I really didn't want to go out there and weed the carrots. But um, <laughs> it does have to be done. But it does, look, it's, it's a beautiful tonic to hours and hours in a kitchen. You know, being outside, meeting the frost, you know, on uh, Sunday morning, I discovered that you, when when lettuce freezes in the garden, when you you know when you leave lettuce at the back of the fridge and it gets frozen and it always just thaws out slimy. Well, when it gets frozen in central Victoria and it's still in the ground, it's fine when the sun comes out. But I did learn this week that if you pick frozen lettuce, it stays frozen. <laughs> so. There'll be a few adjustments over winter with the picking times, but it's a careful balance, but it's a, it's a joy because I love both of the things that I do. Thank you to Stephanie and Annie for imparting your pearls of wisdom here this evening. It's been a real pleasure to have you both here, so thank you really thank very you. much for coming. <laughs>